Riding shotgun refers to the practice of sitting next to the driver in a moving vehicle. The term riding shotgun came around after the time of the stagecoach, when somebody used to sit next to the driver holding a shotgun, in case they ran into bandits. My name is Charlie Cook, and I drive a lot. I like to talk to people while I'm driving, so I interview people in my car while I'm driving. Welcome to Riding Shotgun with Charlie. All right, before we get started on this episode of Riding Shotgun with Charlie, I wanna say thank you for tuning in and watching the show. You can watch the show on YouTube, on GunStreamer, on Full30, and on the Ops Lens app. You can listen to the show in podcast form on all of the podcast outlets. And uh, what I really need you to do is to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you have not done that, and hit the notification bell so you know that shows are coming out. And if you'd like to support the show, you can get some GunGram and some Riding Shotgun with Charlie stickers and patches and uh, I actually have a few of the credit card knives as well so if you want to help the show that would be great this is how we take the stagecoach across America all right welcome to this episode of riding shotgun with Charlie today I am in Southington Connecticut did I say that right? Southington, Connecticut. Southington, Connecticut. And I have with me Mary Forges from the DC Project did I say that right? <laughs> the DC, DC Project. Project. No, Forges is what I'm Forges. looking for. Yeah, okay. Forges. I never know. Yeah, uh, I love this. She's got her DC Project shirt on. It's I, I can't read it because I feel like a pervert. <laughs> uh, what does it say, though? <laughs> it says, educate, advocate, inspire, mentor, organize, and protect. And protect. Awesome. I've got my brandy new Riding Shotgun with Charlie teal colored logo shirt, which you can get at the uh, Riding Shotgun with uh, Riding Shotgun with Charlie.com. Let's drive around Southington. It's going to be an experience. Southington. How come it's <laughs> Southington and not Southington? Southington? You put the why is, so why is Worcester, Worcester, not Worcester? <laughs> <laughs> There's no H. <laughs> Worcester. <laughs> right. All right. So we are here in Southington, Connecticut, and I've got Mary with me. Mary is one of the new, uh, she's like the new cool hip chick in, in the gun world and on the uh, on the, the DC project scene. And bam, where are we going here? Um, take a right. We're going to take a right. Yeah. All right. Can we ride on red? Yeah, this this is an interesting intersection. It is. Are those guys going straight? I don't see a no turn on red, so we're yeah, turning on red. You can go on red. Breaking the law, breaking the law. All right, let's talk about you. You had something completely crazy and freaky happen to you uh, a few years ago, which we're going to get into. Um, but before we get into this, uh, have you always been a gun gal? How did you get into shooting? How did you... I have not always been a gun gal. I actually... Um, when I was growing up, I remember my grandfather, he had a revolver, but that was the only time, other than Nerf guns, that's all I knew about yeah. any type of, um, I guess, firearm, was my grandfather had his. It's not something I ever saw him shoot or anything, he just carried it around, and it was like part of his daily wardrobe, like an accessory. Nice! Yeah. So then, um, when I, but my mother, when I was a teenager out in Kansas, she did have um, her and her husband had purchased firearms, but I wasn't living with them at the time, so I would go out there and visit like in the summertime, but it wasn't something I was around all the time or anything. Should we go and this then, way or stay straight? You can go straight. Okay. Yeah. I hope you're not going to get me lost. I'm not going to get you lost. Okay. I, I see. I, You have to have faith in me that I can drive, and I have to have faith have in you that we can get back faith. to where we're going back. I have all the faith. All the faith. All right. I know these. Because you got to have. Yeah, I know all the back roads. Awesome. So, um, then when my daughter was born, she was about two years old, went out again to Kansas to go visit my mother, and that was my first time ever shooting a gun was um, finally the guns that she had was my first, you know, they set them up in the backyard, Kansas, yeah. there's like no neighbors for miles, oh so um, you were able to just kind of like set up in the backyard and shoot. That's some so America. it's pretty neat. Um, so that was my first time ever shooting a gun, and then when, I'm gonna say about seven years ago, about seven years ago is when I had 
gone through a breakup with my boyfriend. Um, peaceful breakup, no drama there or anything. So it's not like it triggered for me to get my firearm. Right. But at the same time, um, he was a little bit of a liberal, I'm going to say. So he was... This is why you broke up, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, great guy. It's just um, different different interests, I want to say. So I ended up, after, after that breakup, I ended up going and getting a permit. And I was like, well, also because I was single and having two kids, I said, you know, it's probably my responsibility as my as a parent to protect my children yeah. with by all means and that would include at least having the opportunity to have a gun you know um, so I went and I reached out to my friend Otis who is a sergeant in my town and he also does permit classes um, and he ended up doing my class for me got my permit mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna say probably like six months later, I decided to actually go and buy my first gun. So it took me a little while. And um, it was because my boss at the time, he had been going to the range regularly. And he's like, oh, like I'll buy your first gun for you, let's go. So wow. so we ended up going, um, he, he got me a Glock 43 and I loved it. Cool. And that was my baby. And then, um, so yeah, that's how I got into firearms in general. And I was never, I'm gonna be honest, like I, I've never been, as I said earlier, never been into like politics in general until recently. I've never, it's never, I never thought that it applied to my life, but obviously it does. And people don't right. actually realize how much of an impact it is. And um, I've never been huge into the gun industry until, um, and that, not even when I first bought my first gun. It was more so after my incident happened in sure. 2019 is when I was like, wow, like guns are really important. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. an important tool that people need to have. So yeah, a lot of, I mean, a lot of people grow up, um, I call it a gun agnostic where the it's, you know, they're, it's, it's not a thing. Um, mm -hmm. it's not a thing. It's not an issue, but then something happens and, uh, it, it changes their life. And, and for me, um, I, I didn't grow up hunting or shooting, and, and I, 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 my father passed away when I was a kid. So I, we, in my house, everyone had long hair and earrings. Like right. it was, it's just, it's right. just what it was. But um, it, it changed for me after I had a kid. Like I, my son was born in, uh, in 2001, and then on September 11th, uh, things things really changed. And I'm like, oh my god, we live in a dangerous world. I've got this little boy that I need to protect. And in order for me to protect him, I should probably get a gun. Yep. And uh, it comes with it comes with a huge responsibility. And I think the more um, the more classes that I take, the more I get into it, the more uh, I embrace myself. The more I realize it's a huge responsibility to uh, to carry a firearm. It is, and a lot of people don't realize how big of a responsibility, especially in the past couple of years, amount of people that just mm. got their permits. Um, I don't think they realize. The, the responsibility you know like what comes behind that that right. they have to continue their training it's not just getting that piece of paper or that mm. plastic card saying like hey i can leave, legally obtain a firearm right but there's a lot of training that comes in with that for sure mm, for sure for sure it's uh we're currently there are 25 states that have permitless carry and a lot of uh i, I think it's really interesting I, I was talking with some people recently and they were saying that when when states get permitless carry, uh, the training actually goes up because more people want to, to seek out more training. Yeah. Um, it's not you know, everyone gets guns and, and buys a gun and buys ten rounds of ammunition and puts in their gun and leaves it in the uh, you know leaves it in the dresser or wherever. Um, you, you do have to get some training. You have to learn about it. Absolutely. You got to learn how to shoot and, and, and everything else. And I, I do I, I have come around to see that the the flaw with requiring training is that um, people think that that's all the training that they need uh, and it's not I agree not well, it's I, I've noticed that a lot of the clients that have come in through our training company are people um, a, a lot of them aren't necessarily in that two-way community mm -hmm. and they don't necessarily advertise that they're doing training or anything like that but they'll come in for those fundamental courses and which obviously impresses me and I'm really proud that people are continuing that education after getting their permit um, but there are I don't think that they realize that there's so much more than just that fundamental course oh, sure. and they think that if they get into training like oh like that means that I'm like 
um, you know, they, they automatically think it means that they, they're taking a political stance, that they're saying, like, that I'm a Republican or whatever, and they're not realizing, like, that 2A applies to everybody, and they, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it kind of yeah. gets into, like, a taboo subject for people where they're just like, I don't want to go and get super anxious with my gun training because then it's going to try to, it, you know, people might classify me as something that I'm not. <laughs> right? And I'm just like, <laughs> but... Oh, it's, it's completely frustrating. I mean... You know, we live in occupied territory. I have some some friends, some friends that I lived with. Um, after I get, became a gun guy, they're like, "Oh, you know, um, we knew you before you got into guns, so we know you're not some, you know, right wing gun nut." And right. I'm like, oh, right, "Let's right. not be ridiculous." But right. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't having a gun that made me become a gun nut. It's it's me seeing that um, everything is everything is infringement, licensing, training requirements. Uh, Background checks, magazine restrictions, right. all this, all this stuff that uh, that we live with, um, it's all infringement, and that's probably what turned me a little more uh, to lean politically to the right, or at least uh, maybe more libertarian and say, listen, you know, let people live and let them, right. let them be themselves, man, let them do what they want to do, as long as they're not bothering me. Well, like I don't see what the problem is. Right, and I don't think people realize that there's. You know, so regularly there's these different types of infringements or like others, they're proposing different bills and different ways that they can come at you. Um, and the thing is, is that like the reason I became a gun nut was be more so because I want my kids to have that opportunity when they're adults, you know, just to have the option of having a gun. They don't have to have one, right. but I want them to have that option of having one. And I'm realizing like that option is, could possibly be taken away. Like they're pushing pretty hard. So that makes me nervous that my children and their children aren't going to have that opportunity that we have now. Mm. And that that's going to be decided on off of people's personal emotions and beliefs now, you know? Yeah. So, and that's why I don't think emotions really belong in politics or business anyway. So mm. that, that you shouldn't be making decisions based off of emotions that are going to affect people down the road. So Right. Yeah, it's not our decision to, uh, it's not our call to make decisions for other people. Right. Right. Although there are a lot of liberal wackos. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, you know, when I teach classes, I always tell people, I'm like, look, I try not to talk politics. I try to stay focused on guns. Right. We have three types of people. We have the pro-gun folks, we have the non-gun folks, and the anti-gun wackos. And I, I say, I'll try to call them the anti-gun folks, but uh, yeah, if yeah. wacko slips out, I apologize. Yes. <laughs> they... They are wackos. <laughs> they, are. <laughs> they are. They are. And I hate saying that, but it's uh, it's it's nuts. I, I'm sure you've you've experienced this as well. Yeah, I experienced this as well. I have plenty of friends that are like, well, you know, what are you going to carry a gun for? Are you going to shoot someone when you you know you, someone's going to follow you? You know, they're going to you're going to get into a fight on the side of the road. I'm like, dude, I'm in my fifties. I've never gotten into a fight on the side of the road. Yeah. Have you ever gotten into a fight on the side of the road? Well, no. Okay. What are, you, what are you worried about, man? But if you had intent to do anything criminal with your firearm, you wouldn't be going and staying on top of your licensing and your training <laughs> and right. respecting the laws even though you don't want to. Like, if you had criminal intent, you wouldn't be doing all these things to right. stay in line. You, exactly, so, exactly. It's, it's people that, um, you know, that are criminals or felons that have different goals. <laughs> they, they do. They do. It's, uh, you know, guns are just tools. That's all they really are. Mm -hmm. That is all they really are. All right. So you've been a gun gal for a while. Um, your boss got you your, your first Glock. Yeah. Um, then an instant happened. Let's get yes. into this. This is, I don't want to say this is what made you famous. This no, is what made you aware. It's, um, and made people aware of you. I, I have to be honest. It's kind of cool to see the process of being able to share a story mm -hmm. and then seeing how much of an impact it really has made. Um, because when this incident happened in November of 2019, you know, I spent the first couple months kind of sitting with it and, um, you know, my, my phone going off from the courthouse for victim advocacy saying like, hey, this is when your upcoming court dates are, so, you know, mm -hmm. to face this person in court, COVID happened and then I wasn't able to move forward with it and it kind of sat on the back burner when COVID happened, no more court dates or anything like that. And I had to sit with the the event in my head um, by myself and not be able to move 
court. So <laughs> that's why I was like, you know what? I have to talk to somebody about it. So well, did, like, they, did, did you find a therapist to talk I to? Di- I did. I, okay. I ended up going to um, a therapist who's an amazing woman. And she she helped me a lot with like EMDR. So it's a, uh, what's that? It's a type of therapy that um, it, it basically helps you with... I don't even know what it stands for, honestly. I'll have to look at so what you did. Highly perfect. Right. We'll, we'll, look it <laughs> we'll, up. we'll look it up. But it helps you with trauma. If you've been in a traumatic experience, it helps you kind of um, retell it, but how to deal with it and where it's not going to trigger you. Mm. Um, so basically, I I started talking to her about it. And then um, after, I'm going to say May of 2020, so we're a few months into COVID, and I wasn't able to go to back go back to work yet because I was in the restaurant industry, mm-hmm. and I took over my boyfriend's company, Paravan Group. And when I took over, we started doing a lot of women's classes because they didn't really exist here in Connecticut, other than a girl and a gun, which a lot of people don't. They honestly don't know about it. Um, so Robin, you need to step it up, girl. <laughs> so, like, I didn't know about it until I'm gonna say into later of 2020, and I had had my permit for a decent amount of years by that point. So when I started um, taking over with his firearm training and creating that female community, one night he had to run, um, to the building we were doing training in is four floors and he had to run from the fourth floor down to the second floor to go grab another gun that somebody wanted to test drive basically in the mm-hmm. class. So I was, and I did all the photography and videography for our courses. So I was standing there on the range with these women and I had eight women in front of me and one of them was talking about how nervous she was because this was this was like an intro to handgun course so other than her permit course it was her first course um since then and she was talking about that she was nervous and then another woman was talking about that she had lost her um nephew in a shooting and that she was nervous because she's thinking about what that other person is going to be feeling and you know so everyone and i started realizing that all these women had stories but they never had actually fully talked about it so at that time i was like I don't know why, but I, I went out of um, my comfort zone and I told my story and it helps all eight of those women move forward in that course that night where they're like, you know what, like this is important because, um, you know, to protect themselves, to protect their children. Mm-hmm. And so that was, I'm going to say May or June of 2020. Um, and then... A, about a year later after doing these women's only intro to handgun courses I met Holly Sullivan I did like a, a meet-and-greet women's event at um, our training range and I had not met Holly previously but I reached out to her and I was like hey um, I see that you are a female in this industry and that you're the president of the CCDL and I would love for you to come down and introduce yourself so she came down um, introduced herself and then she mentioned the DC project and that I was like hey those might be my kind of people (laughs) (laughs) so um, so that's how everything kind of escalated since my incident and how much it benefited me that you know just from sharing my story and then Holly hearing my story and then her also saying like hey like we would like for you to come down um, to Gainesville Florida in October and share your story and just you know, we, we just want to kind of meet you and for you to meet us and see if there's there could be like a relationship there moving forward. And right. there definitely is one. It's, it's pretty cool. Cool. So. All right. We're going to pick up with that. Let's talk about the incident. Yes, absolutely. We've we stringed people along long enough. Um, just to give you quick background, I had previously been working with veterans and this specific person, I, because one question I always get is, did you know this person? I mm-hmm. did know this person um, through me helping veterans that were going through substance abuse hiccups issues struggling with that and um yeah okay so (laughs) all right so november 15th of 2019 it was a friday night my son was at a sleepover my daughter was at the movies with her friends and around about a half hour after my daughter actually left so i'm gonna say around like nine o'clock at night um i was upstairs in my bedroom with one of my dogs and I kept my dogs separate because they hated each other and um all right that's a whole another issue why do you have two dogs that hate each other like why don't you get rid of one of them I did I ended up (laughs) I did I'm I'm not a pet guy so this is no 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 I I ended up getting rid of one of them um he actually now lives 
up in Massachusetts with family. So uh, okay. didn't totally kick him to the curb because I love him, but he does. He did get a rehomed with family. So, but at the time they had hated each other for probably about like a month. Like they okay. were just going All at right. it. So there's three. Right. There's still, yeah, yeah. There's a little trial here. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so I'm upstairs and I'm in my bedroom with one of the dogs and I'm texting my employer at the time. So I had just started at Delta Arsenal, which is shooting range down here in Connecticut. So that was actually me transitioning into the firearm industry on my own mm. prior to this happening um so i was texting him about like you know thank you for the opportunity this week you know um really looking forward to everything yada yada and as i'm texting him there my house kind of shakes and i hear a bang and i obviously go running downstairs like there's a problem so I um, run downstairs and this gentleman Mike is standing in my kitchen I hate calling him gentleman I usually have a much colorful <laughs> colorful word but I understand that there's right. cameras something something you know something <laughs> so, like something Samuel Jackson would say yeah exactly right <laughs> so um <laughs> so he had come through my back door and I had um certifications not legitimate like where I had degrees but certifications with mental health and that's obviously what I had been working with people with previously and I was like all right so maybe I can you know try to de-escalate the situation yeah. defuse this um and he knows me I know him it's not a complete stranger so I'm like maybe this is something I'm gonna be able to help him figure out but obviously my heart is racing and I'm like this person just broke in through my back door like this is obviously a problem um I could tell that he was on something like his eyes he just he was not there he saw right through him um and he was you know he's sweaty but like pale so he just did not look healthy mm -hmm. and I could tell that he was on something um and we later found out that he had opiates in his system and alcohol so he just was not great at that moment um so standing in my kitchen and um you know trying to say you know what happened oh right. let me back up a little bit that morning I did get a phone call at 10 o'clock in the morning um, from the doctor he so Mike was at the Stonington Institute down by Foxwoods and he was in there for a program for substances and um, the VA had actually just transferred him there and he was there for a couple days yeah. and the doctor called me on that Friday morning and said um, we have to let you know because um, you know Mike doesn't his family had cut him off from communication for the most part so he um, had put me down as an emergency contact because I had been helping him through his process for substances. So yeah. doctor calls me, says um, Mike ACA, which is against clinical advice. He left our program. We told him he should be staying here and he said he's not going to and that he was taking off. Um, from their understanding, he was going back to the Boston area. So he's actually from Brockton, Bridgewater area. Yeah. So they said he's going to looks like he's going back up there but we just have to call and let you know because you're at emergency contact so I said okay so back to him standing in my kitchen he's um, he says to me you know completely panicked he's like uh, you know I left the doctors today he tells me that they let him out that um, you know that they let him out because he was done with the program obviously that's a lie because I already knew the answer to that and um, he says that he is looking for a piece of paper that the, that they apparently had given him that day that shows um, his blood levels that he has cirrhosis and cancer and that he's dying and he, he needed this piece of paper and that's why he broke in through my back door um, is this something so, you would keep at your house no and the only time that he had been to my house previous to that was um, you know, like earlier that Jul earlier that year in July, my daughter had a birthday party, and my my brother knew him from the VA because my brother also was in the VA. So my brother knew him from the VA, and my brother had brought him and like three or four other guys um, from the VA with him a weekend of my daughter's birthday back in July, and they helped move stuff from my house to the park for the cookout. Mm -hmm. So that's the only time, that's why he knew where I lived was because okay. um, he had been there for that previously. And um, so yeah. So then he, he says he's looking for this piece of paper. I'm like, uh, you know what, I don't have it, blah, blah, blah. And he's saying like, no, like it definitely has to be here. And I'm like, okay, you know what? Like I'm gonna help you find it. And obviously I'm like, I don't, 
know what he's looking for, but I'm gonna pretend that I'm gonna help him look for it. And then at the same time, call for help and have somebody, you know, have the police come. Cause again, there's, this guy broke in through my still door. House, That's yeah. still my main focus is that, you know, there is a threat there. So I, um, I went upstairs, I said, stay, stay right here. I'm gonna go put my dog back upstairs in my bedroom cause so they don't kill each other. Yeah. And, um, but also my phone was upstairs on my bed at the time because when I was texting my boss and when I heard this noise, I ran downstairs and I kind of threw my phone to the side. Sure. And I should have brought it with me, but I panicked and ran downstairs, honestly. I don't know why. Um, lessons. These are lessons, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, so I ended up uh, going back up into my bedroom and I go to shut the door or I, I go to put the dog in the room and I walk across the room, my bed's on the other side of the room and I go to pick up my phone um to call for help and as i'm picking up my phone and i turn back around and i go to like I, I walk outside my bedroom door and he's coming up the stairs so it's a little freaky yeah so he's coming up the stairs and he does this thing where he kind of like puts his arms out like one arm out in front of him saying like go in front of me type of thing mm -hmm. um where he wanted me to go down the stairs and i was like mike i, I gotta be on it and this is where I don't know if this was my, I don't know. I think I've made a lot of mistakes, but um, I said, this feels off. There's something wrong here. You're gonna have to give me a second and and I'm gonna have to like go in my room and basically like figure out what's going on type of thing. Right. Um, I don't remember the exact wording, but it's literally like this feels off and you're gonna have to give me a second. So I turned around and I went to go walk into my room and um, this all happened very quickly, even though sure. the story the story's dragged out, but it happens really quickly. Um, so I go back into my room and I went to go like, at the same time of shutting my door and sliding the lock shut, I was about to like uh, exit out of the text with my employer and mm -hmm. then then open up the call app and then press 911, like go through the whole right. process. But I realized that's a lot of um, work just to get into the phone app. And at the time, I did not know that if you hold down the two buttons on your phone, the power and the volume, I believe, yeah. that it will give you an option to call 911 immediately. Right. So that's an important thing that people should know. Um, so I go back into my bedroom, slide the door shut, and instead of backing out of the call, I just, at the very top, I hit the person, the contact's name, and hit call. That way I'd have somebody on the phone. So it was like a quick mm -hmm. um, maneuver that I was, I was hoping that somebody would get onto the phone pretty quickly. So I press call and at the same time I move across the room back over to my bed because I want to get a far, as far away from that door as possible at that sure. time. That's um, good thinking. Yep. <laughs> so, and it took him, I, th I think it was around like eight times um, to use his body to slam up on my door and to break in through that um, sliding lock that was on my door. Um, and when the police actually had come later on, they were looking for the, the, the ring part that connects to the door frame where the lock goes into. And it was on the other side of the room. So the force from his body, wow. like it flew all over to the other side of the room. Um, so he, he comes in the door and um, he's, obviously looks like he's going to kill me and tells me um yells at me to put the phone down and at that time i already had the phone ringing and um i obviously wasn't gonna hang up the phone call or anything like that and he comes at me and immediately he gets on top of me and pushes me down in the bed and starts choking me so both hands are around my neck and um obviously i'm moving a lot trying to trying to just get him fight off him me off. Yeah, yeah fight him off me um and so he starts hitting me in the face and then he then goes back to choking me and um at that time you know i'm i'm pulling his hands trying to pull his hands off of my neck but i have like uh my my left hand is on his hands my right hand is over to my right side mm -hmm. and he um yeah so he's choking me i'm trying to get air and then he ends up hearing the voice on the phone. So by that time, the voicemail ends up picking up. Not a person, mm -hmm. which I was hoping for a human being to pick up. Right. But uh, the voicemail picks up and he hears, he doesn't hear what they're saying, but he just hears that there's a male voice on the phone. And obviously he's thinking like, shit, I gotta hang up this phone call. Right. So he uh, 
then takes his right forearm and puts it onto my neck and he, his left hand is over my right hand and he's trying to pry that phone out of my hands and that's when you know I, I went from like shit I have to breathe to like okay like what am I gonna look like when Lily comes home like oh my god like my daughter's gonna see my face completely be in my body like I don't know what she's gonna see mm. honestly but I know she's gonna see her mom lifeless um, right. completely dead and that you know I, I did and, and at the same time I'm thinking like I don't care if he breaks my fingers when he's trying to get this phone out of my hands but I, I did not want to let go of that phone because at the same time I didn't know that it was a voicemail either like I just right. I heard the voice pick up um, so I I was not gonna let go of that phone and then something clicked where I was like shit like you know when Lily comes home from the movies not only is she gonna see me dead but she's also going to possibly be that next victim so never mind what am I gonna look like what is she gonna look like and right. imagining like your child going through anything like that um tearing up a little bit right now but to, like, to imagine your child going through anything like that that puts more fight in you than for your own life <laughs> like I don't yeah. I never realized that um even as being a parent for all those years I never realized like how much your kid's life matters more than your own so I um I realized that his focus was the phone at that moment and my focus was Lily. So I dropped my phone between the bed and the wall and I, um, you know, his, his body shifted to my right side. So he was trying to like grab that phone from that fell between the bed and the wall. And he, uh, I, I had the opportunity where I just started like punching him a bunch of times with my left hand into his right ribs. Um, and finally, you know, he, he kind of gets off me a little bit and is trying to get that phone still. And I was able to push him off off me also, like, fully get out from underneath him. I run back to the other side of my room where my dresser was and open the top drawer and pulled out my beautiful Glock 43. And um, I ended up pointing at him. So I turn around and I was like, in my head, I'm like, holy shit, like, I'm literally aiming a firearm at a human being. Like, nobody... Nobody wants to take somebody else's life. That's not a goal, unless you are a criminal, unless you have ill intent. But even in those moments, like you don't want to have to kill somebody, and but you will. And um, you know, so he he turns around, he hangs up the phone, and he he kind of laughs and he says, "Are are you going to shoot me?" And at first, I I froze because. Um, or I did not that I froze, but I didn't respond mm -hmm. because I'm processing that in my head too. Like right. I'm, I'm processing like, shit, I'm gonna shoot somebody. Um, and then uh, he he asked again, like like he kind of laughed, like a creepy laugh, and he's like he's like you're really gonna shoot me, and I was like if you if you get up if you come at me again, I'm going to shoot you. Mm -hmm. And um, the one thing I say often is that you know the officers afterwards one of the officers had asked me you know what was his reaction what did his face look like when when you had your gun pointed at him like what was how was he acting I said I have no idea because all I could see was his blurry torso in the background and my front sights were completely clear and I was ready for that and so I wasn't paying attention to his face I was making sure that that shot was gonna be effective right um so when I realized he wasn't moving. I realized, I processed that I was able to de-escalate that situation at, at least enough where I was able to retreat. So I um, noticed that the door, my bedroom door is closer to my, closer to me now, which was now on my left. And so I dodged out my bedroom door and went right across the hallway. <laughs> like, like, it's like you look for that first security point of like, okay, where can I find um, some type of shelter, immediate shelter, yeah. not thinking that it's not practical shelter. So I went right across the hall into the bathroom and I slid that lock shot. Um, still had my gun on me, but I realized, all right, I'm in a much smaller room. And like, as I'm sliding the lock shot, I'm like, shit, this is the same lock that he just broke through in my bedroom. So literally the exact same, same um, right. lock. So I was like, if he, if he could do that, then he could break through this. So then I'm like, like, oh my God, like he's going to come at me in here. Um, but then I could hear him, you know, kind of moving around. Um, I think he's walking around a little bit, maybe in my room. I could hear him at, that he was at a distance. Um, 
and he's he was talking, which apparently I think he was talking to himself because again he's drugged up, he's kind of medicated at that point. So um, I end up cracking the bathroom door open, realizing that he's still in my room and he's further away. Um, and I ran down the stairs immediately to my left and out the front door. Um, you know, front sidewalk, run, you know, crazy lady, middle of November with a, not crazy lady, but <laughs> I'm not, I'm not a crazy person with a gun, but a, a, there's a lady, there's a lady running down, down the sidewalk, you know, middle of November in shorts and a t-shirt barefoot. It's Target Sports USA. That's Target Sports. We should Sports. see if they have ammo. We, yeah, they definitely have ammo. They actually have a... Tactical police gears back there. And I, I, I saw it when we drove by. Yeah. Uh, Target Sports, they, they ship everywhere. Yeah, Target Sports is great. Sorry. Um, so basically I, you know, running, running down the sidewalk um, to my neighbor's house and there was a car that drove by and I'm thinking like, I hope to God that they call the cops mm. and say, I just saw somebody running with a gun, even though that obviously puts me in a little bit of danger. But at the same time, um, I was thinking like, as long as it will get the cops here called quicker. And, um, so I, I go to the neighbors and I banging on the, they had like their, their storm door locked. It was like a full glass door. So I'm banging on that thinking like, you know, I might break their glass, but I don't care. Like, I'm sorry, but I don't care. Right. Um, and the, the guy ends up coming out and I'm like, you know, please call please. I was just, you know, somebody just broke into my house, attacked me, etc. And there's a chain link fence separating my yard and my neighbor's yard. So as I'm standing there talking to my neighbor, um, not talking casually, but I'm panicking to my right. neighbor and I look over and Mike had come out the back door, the same door that he broke into, comes out the back door and I just see like the amber from a cigarette and he lights up a cigarette, like casual. And um, really, really scary to realize that psychological break that people can hit that they no longer have any type of feeling. Um, they have no remorse. They have no emotion. They don't even realize what they just did to somebody. Um, so, by the so then I end up going back down the sidewalk to, by my house, um, back in through the front door that I came out of, coming through the front door, and I, I've never done like a barricade type of training course or low light or anything like that. But at that time, you know, my house was pretty dark and. Um, I had to move around the downstairs of my house and go from the front door to the back door and I, w I just wanted to make sure that he was still in that backyard basically yeah. um, and so I ended up um, I go to the back I see that he's still in the back and I just sat there waiting for the police so the police took at least um, over 10 minutes to get there actually this is the same wow. the same sergeant that had helped me with my permit class I reached out yeah. to him I said I reached out to him like a couple months ago I said hey can you just give me give me the time like give me an idea of like how long it actually took for you guys to respond that night and he's like well yeah. you have to understand like there was a shift change going on at that time and we're all in roll call and by the time you get it into um, by the time dispatch gets it and it hits the towers and like the timing and everything he's like it's at least like 10 minutes Ten so minutes. holy crap yeah So it took 10 minutes for the police to get there? It did. I actually reached out to my friends um, that had did my permit class, obviously a few, few years back, seven years ago, and I asked him, because he was the sergeant on that night, I asked him how long it took, and he said that by the time that it hits the, the towers, the cell towers, and also because they were in roll call at the time, and with all these different pieces that came into play, um, that the estimate is over 10 minutes, but obviously the time that the actual call went in, it doesn't start until like a minute or two after that first, so when the call goes in. Um, so legit, this old saying that we hear, when seconds count, the police oh, yeah. are minutes away. <laughs> yeah, could yeah. you imagine like if I, if, let's say in that moment, if I had ended up calling the police, um, which would, would have been ideal. If I would have called the police when he first broke into my room, then if that had taken 10 minutes, it, I still would have had to go through that same struggle, the same fight, everything I still went through that still yeah. happened in less than 10 minutes. So yes, they would have gotten there sooner, but really with them, with that 10 minute wait, I was waiting in my house um, for them to arrive rather than fighting for my life, if that makes sense. So yeah. it's, you know, I, 
I'm, I'm not trying to cut you off here, but um, I do always tell people, listen, the, the, nothing against the police. The, the police are, even though the, even though the car says to serve and protect, it's really the clean up and right of the court. It is. It really is. It is. They, and I'll be honest, like the, the original arresting officer had it put down like all of the charges that they should, that they should have put down. And later on, you know, about, um, actually not about a week later. So that Monday when we were going to court is when they added on all the additional charges. But that those original charges gave him the opportunity to have a lower bond to be able to get out. And his sister ended up bonding him out that when this had happened, you know, by the time everything was wrapped up, um, I'm gonna say around like 10.30, 11 o'clock between like, you know, the police leaving from writing reports and everything and me getting checked out. Um, around 3.30, I was able to actually start to fall asleep. And at 5.30, I get a text from the officer that was patrolling my district to say like his sister had not only bailed him out or bonded him out, but that he had also returned back to my address and they arrested him back on the front steps of my home was, while I was sleeping. So um, he was he was homeless. He was obviously still had stuff in his system. And even though the conditions of his release was to, hey, you obviously cannot return back to this address because there's, you know, there's a victim involved. Right. Um, he did not care what the police said so and the, he still, so it actually ended up um, on the news. It says like, uh, you know, knock, tuck, arrest, um, or no, I think it says like Massachusetts man arrested twice in one night or whatever, like within eight hours. So That's how we roll in the Commonwealth. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah so <laughs> it was, um, it was really scary. So there's, if I, if I didn't have my gun, right? If I didn't have something to run to, even if I attempted to just run out my door, my bedroom door and down the stairs, then he could have easily pushed me down the stairs. He would have came after me. I didn't yeah. have anything to keep him, to, to have control over me, keep him at bay. Um, so 100% that gun saved my life. Like, I can't, I can't say that anything else would have, there, there's no other, no, no, other, no other tool or, you know, talking to him, because I had attempted that when he first came in, like trying to calm him down and be like, you know, let's talk about what's going on. Um, so there's nothing, at all that de-escalated that situation other than my gun. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, court case, what happens with this guy? So, court case, we ended up going to, um, obviously like the initial, the initial court case that like Monday, right after it had happened, um, cause when he got arrested that second time, then they ended up keeping him in until that Monday, cause he obviously violated those conditions of release. And when, what? I was gonna say, so they they let him go the first time, but yeah. they caught him the second time. Then they really mean business. Then they're like, oh, <laughs> right, uh, he's not a good guy. We have to enforce the law. <laughs> Got right. it. So, anyways, um, then they. So in December, we ended up having a court date. In January, we have a court date, and it's more so where they're. You know, he had somebody representing him and saying like that he's not a menace or anything like that and that he's going to um, stay sober and that he's in a program and that, that all of this was caused because of substances and that he's going to be on better behavior. Um, was there a program before? Yes. There, okay. was, there was about a decade of programs, I'm going to say. A decade so, of programs. Yeah. But now it's really going to work. N now it's going to work. Yeah. Yep. Now they're serious. So... <sighs> They, um, then COVID hit and then, you know, being on that whole victim phone list, every time that there's a court date coming up for your, mm. for your case, they call, it's an automated system and they're like, we have to let you know this case number, it's gotten delayed again. So like every other month I was getting a phone call saying like all through COVID, like it's gotten delayed, it's gotten delayed. I'm like, God, like it's, it's like, I just wanted to get it done with and shut, shut down, you know? Yeah. Um, and then April of 2021, I get a phone call that he actually had died. They found him dead in wow. a hotel room up in Bridgewater, Brockton area. Um, Brockton. And he, Shocking. Yeah, Brockton. No Brockton. offense to anybody from Brockton, but 
So it's I used to teach healthy. in a town next to Brockton. Okay. Right? I used to teach in Stoughton next to Brockton. And there may have been a gentleman's club there. Yeah, maybe. It may have been Alex's. Maybe. It may have been Alex's. <laughs> and um, I had a student in Stoughton whose mother worked there. So this kid would go, seventh, uh, seventh or eighth grade, this kid would go to the strip joint to wait for his mom to finish her day shift because she wow. was a day shifter. Impressive. Yeah. It's Impressive. Okay. Right. Let's hear it for Brockton. <laughs> Mm. So, anyway. but yeah, they, they did end up finding him um, dead. He had been there for a few days, and wow. around that same time is when I met Holly. So, there's the happy ending. There's the happy ending. Literally, it's like as, and again, previously, I was like, I, I've always been a, an advocate on some level, whether it's for, you know, veterans, or if it has to do with, um, you know, for child abuse and stuff like that. I've always been an advocate for opportunities for people to have better options in life you know um and but it's always been from you know with the, with the veteran thing is more so because of, of what my brother had lived previously and i was like oh i'm doing it for my brother and like this right. year i'm like wow like the, you know as much as i appreciate the the opportunity to share my story with other women through our fire tra firearm training company I realized like meeting Holly in the DC project I'm like wow like now my story actually has the opportunity to make a larger impact and it's not just you know like I'm not gonna say casual conversation but it's not it's not like that conversation is gonna end there you know it's yeah. not like the story ends there with that person I'm telling it to now not only am I able to share my story but um, you know I just had this past Wednesday night we did a a DC project for Connecticut. We did like our monthly Zoom meeting, and um, this new girl that had joined us, she has a story. So like these, now there's these people that have stories. These women that have stories mm -hmm. that I'm kind of I'm not gonna say setting that standard, but I'm showing them the opportunity to sure. make something very positive out of it. And oh my gosh, yeah, it's pretty cool. That's pretty wild. Yeah, so the, the goal is, as much as I love the opportunity to share my story, um, the goal is that I want to I want to kind of let these women know that their story matters and that they have a massive mm. impact. And um, a lot of them are, you know, mothers and how it's going to affect their children and or like other women in their social circle, you know, at the yeah. kids' baseball game that other women might feel like it's again that taboo subject that nobody wants to talk about and i'm just trying to give that opportunity that like no this is normal like it's right it's literally in the constitution that's how normal it is it's like written about <laughs> so everyone should right. have the opportunity what's not normal is that people uh, people end up on substances and end up uh end up hurting and harming other people like that's that's not the normal part right that's you know that's my thing and i'll be honest like previously I was 100%, you know, trying to help people in those situations. And then after this, I'm just like, no offense to anybody, but I'm not in that wheelhouse anymore to even attempt right. to help anybody because I, I noticed that um, it takes a, a lot of medical and psychological guidance. It's, on, right, it does take something for them, themselves to. Uh it's not that you don't want to help people, but right. people have to be willing to help themselves. Right, but, exactly. Yeah. Right. And I just, I can't offer that anymore. So now I'm trying to help people on a different level. But I just... Yeah. Um, the but yeah, the, victims. The, the struggle with substance abuse and not just substance, like substance abuse is obviously, you know, a subcategory of psychological stuff that's going on, you mm -hmm. know? So it's really the that whole psychological aspect and it has nothing to do with like gun owners or anything like that. It's literally... Everybody is struggling with something, but too many people avoid it, and they find ways to cover cover up those struggles. So, yeah. um, and it's you know I, I hope that people are gonna start having the opportunity to talk about it more. You know, like mm. yeah, it's, yeah, it's definitely a lot. It is a lot. It is a lot. So it's turned out that you have. Uh, You've connected with some of the alpha women, and uh, well, I, alpha women like Holly and Diana Muller and, and uh, Amanda Suffolk and everybody. Um, all these ladies that are in the DC project. Oh, um, I've talked. I've had a number of the DC. So I like this. I like to say that um, I've I've been with Miss Ohio. I've been with Miss Maine. I've been with Miss Texas, Miss Arizona, Miss Miss Connecticut, Miss Rhode Island. 
to Miss Massachusetts. Wow. So right, I get to I get to go through and say I get to hang out with all these chicks. Yeah. Um, uh, so what I want to I don't want to rehash what the DC project is, but um, you get together um, to to go down to Washington DC to, to talk to politicians about the largest growing demographic of firearms owners. Um, but you guys are doing stuff on the state level as well. Yes. So this is, again, in the past, politics really, I didn't know anything about it. It's not that I wasn't, um, that it didn't apply to me. I just didn't know anything about it. So in the past few months alone, I'm realizing different processes that you have through through your state. Because obviously you learned that in like seventh or eighth grade and you don't really touch base on it. You should then. learn in seventh or eighth grade. <laughs> I know. Um, but the, the cool thing is, is like, so I, I had never provided testimony before. And we did that public hearing with the CCDL on March 14th, mm-hmm. where we hosted an event where, um, you know, our, our members, or not just our members, but anybody was able to come and use our laptops. And ha- we had like a social event where people were providing their testimony so they would register ahead of time and then when their number was called they would use our laptops to um, do the public hearing testimony so that was my first time ever providing testimony and I was so nervous and then when I was done I was like holy crap everybody has to do this like this is like it's it's a cool thing to be able to use your voice and just tell you know just talk to people that are in positions you know those powerful positions and be like hey I want to tell you why this is important to me and this is what you can do to help me out to make it you know to, to make it effective so yeah um, so with I, I haven't been to DC yet this will be my first year going down to DC and I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be quite an experience. I was down um, in D.C. back in January when we recorded um, with the video. Yeah, the video. The video. The which video. We'll, we'll put a link for this uh, so, in, the, in the description below. So th- that was my first time going down to D.C. So I'm, I'm glad I had like that little test drive when I was down there. Um, but I'm looking forward to it later on this year. I think we're going down in September. Nice. Um, and that will be a whole new experience for me. So I don't have too much to talk to talk about with that. But as far as like you're talking about like meeting like these very powerful and strong women within this industry. So obviously I've talked about Holly Sullivan. Um, I just I I love her. Like I have so much respect she for her. Like, yeah, she's awesome. Yeah, she really is. We're both um, we're both single moms, and we both hustle hard, mm. and we're driven by passion, and then also driven by paying our checks. So we have like our regular, I mean, paying our bills. So we have like our regular job mm-hmm. um, to make sure that our, our homes are staying um, steady, and then at the same time, we fill all of our extra time with advocacy and like how to make the world a better place. And I just I have so much respect for her because. I, I find myself in her a lot or things that I admire about her that I would like to be like, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, she's just great. And she, she is. I, I have her. a ridiculous story. We were um, we were in Vegas at SHOT Show this year. Yep. And um, we were out late. I heard a few stories about <laughs> SHOT Show Vegas. <laughs> so let's see where this goes. We were out late. And I was... We couldn't find an Uber. We, like it's, oh. it seemed like it was impossible to find where you meet the Ubers. So we ended up walking back, uh, walking. I ended up walking her to her hotel, and before we left, uh, before we left the Venetian, Which, that was a long walk. Wasn't it's it? a long walk. Yeah, she's. She she, she crashed her toe into something and broke yeah. her little toe. Yeah. She powered through and at, walked at least a mile. And she was probably wearing heels because Holly <laughs> always wears heels, so she did it in heels. So she was carrying her heels. That's how she broke her toe. But um, she is she's an amazing trooper. She is. She's an amazing. It sent me a picture of her she's toe. So I'm like, this is disgusting. I don't like this. <laughs> Not the type of feet picks you're into. <laughs> <laughs> Right. It would not go over well on the uh, the feet only fan. Page, no. So. <laughs> so I admire her. Um, I admire all of them, but like uh, Beth Walker. Do you know Beth Walker? I have not had the pleasure of meeting Beth Walker or having her on the show. You're gonna have to have her on the I, show, and plus because she actually just started working with Sig, so she's gonna be up um, oh, in the she's area. She's gonna be in New Hampshire. Yeah, she's all gonna right. be up there at least once a month. 
So I would definitely All right. reach Beth out Walker, to her. I'm coming for you, girl. Do it. So and I don't mean that in a weird, creepy way. <laughs> she's, um, I think she's like 20 or 21. And Young. She just, yeah. <laughs> but she just comes with like such a force. It's insane. And mm. she's um, another one of those go-getters. So she... She does a lot of marketing and advertising stuff throughout the industry. Not throughout the industry. I think she was with Arsenal Media previously. Um, obviously, she does a lot for DC Project. Yeah. And then now she's doing it with SIG. Um, she does the three gun competition. And she, even though she's still younger in age, the girl just, there's no slowing her down. Like, she just mm. has so much going on. So I respect awesome. her a lot because. I have a marketing company that's more small business. Like I'm not working for SIG or anything, but um, I I see what she's doing and I'm like, wow, like that's definitely like my type of person. That's cool. And then obviously Diana Muller, like she's also, she's she wears so many different hats mm. and you know what she's created here with, yeah, the, with the, DC the DC project. Part. And there's no, there's no like, I'm gonna say like financial benefit or gain for her. And it's literally just because she's, She's using the platform that she already had yeah. to make a uh, an impact across the entire nation. So, mm. you know, when I when I saw the, these women that are involved in the DC project, that's why it's like, yes, the, that's where I want to be. Mm. Those are my type of people. You know, I, I came from the restaurant industry, and I'm just like, I don't drink, I don't go out like all these people from the restaurant industry. And I finally found like my type of people within the DC project. So that's cool. It is pretty cool. That is cool. All right, so you talked about how there's no financial, uh, no financial gain. It does take money to do this. So, what kind of things do you do to raise some money to get you to DC? Sure. So, obviously, I've, I've been the state director only for about a month, a little over a month now. So, I'm going to tell you what my goals are. So, um, which I, I already have one of our biannual brunches coming up um, in a few weeks, and cool. I plan on having these brunch fundraisers that are more of also like a meet and greet and to get new delegates to, to sign up for the mm -hmm. DC project, get more women involved. Um, and this gives them the opportunity, they pay $30 and they come and get, um, they, they leave with a swag bag, they leave with, you know, everyone gets like door prize, um, door, the raffle tickets um, for when you arrive. And then you also get like bottomless mimosas, bellinis, bloody marys, right? Bottomless mimosas. See, aren't you sad you're missing it? Yes. When's the next one? <laughs> the next one will be in the fall. I plan on uh, okay. spring and fall. So, Could bottomless um, mimosas? Yeah, bottomless. They're good because they have orange juice in them, right? Yeah, it, exactly. So it's, it's, it's like a health drink. Yeah. It's like a, a juice cleanse or something, right? <laughs> right. Eventually. <laughs> so, it's healthy. It's got a... Uh, It'll be fine. It's got orange juice. Here we go. Yeah. So, um, bottomless, uh, you know, brunch beverages. And nice. then also tons of food. Um, we have, for this one that's coming up in a few weeks, we have um, a Ruger that was donated by a local gun shop that wow. will be a raffle item. Nice. So there's different different things um, that you, you're getting to leave with that day, even, you know, if, even if you're not wanting to be like a face with NDC projects, mm -hmm. everyone's benefiting from, from these events. That's cool. So, um, and the money, all, all proceeds, 100% of it is getting donated by my marketing company to the DC project. So it's not the DC project that's hosting the event. Yep. It's um, typically what we do is we have a private or a, you know, a smaller business or even a larger business that hosts a fundraiser and the funds go directly to the DC project from that company. Um, cool. So that's something I'll be doing. Um, like I said, twice twice a year in Connecticut. I might even go bug Carrie Ann and see if she wants to collaborate on a few of those. Because There's something here in the northeast. Yeah, maybe we'll go up to the, like Sturbridge Mass area or something. Yeah, do, come come to the hometown. Do, do a brunch up there. Um, so then, on top of that, I am creating these relationships with small businesses within Connecticut that are that will host a monthly fundraiser with their business. So one of them um, I did back in February was with a company called Second Armament Company. Mm -hmm. And they it's an apparel company. It's all obviously um, Second Amendment focused. And they actually, they're, 
their shirts and their hoodies were designed for concealed carry. They're, they're made in America. Nice. Um, you know, the cotton comes, I believe, from Louisiana. It gets sent to California. The shirts are made, and then they're sent up here to Connecticut where they're printed. Um, and they're made for concealed carry where they added the two inches to the bottom of the shirt so that way you have um. that. So um, back in uh, February, they did the monthly fundraiser, and we had a I can't remember what the design said. It says I think it says infringe this, and it had like a teal logo on it. Nice. And um, but <laughs> the proceeds from that got donated to DC Project. So uh, another one's a holster company, another one's an ammo company. So there's these different companies within Connecticut. I plan to not only have them as firearm companies you know i want to get mm. other small business like sports you know yeah. sports stores and like mom and pop type places to do um because i'm all about supporting small businesses too yeah absolutely yeah, and absolutely. and what it will be is um every so every january you know syndicate concealment will repeat their same for their business it'll be a tradition we always do the january fundraiser for dc project and then february will always be second Somebody armament else. so it's a tradition on their end and it keeps a oh cool and it keeps a, keeps a steady um fundraiser donation for us yeah. on our end for dc project throughout the year so that's awesome yeah there's there's been a few hiccups nothing crazy but um i think you know it's i think that's gonna be pretty successful it has been pretty su successful that's awesome that's great so that's what i'm doing today. oh my gosh i love having these women on that are uh getting stuff done because it makes me realize how much i'm slacking <laughs> so that is so cool it is pretty cool I'm so so cool so uh are, are you an instructor are you you teach people or i will be an you instructor will be. so okay. the end of june um i get my uscca so um reached out Actually, Brian Chamberlain had reached out to me, oh, and cool. we were going back and forth. Yeah, um, he's from Delta Defense, mm -hmm. and we were talking about putting together, um, or he, he was putting together a course. And he's like, "Hey, the next one that I'm having is end of June. Would love for you to come and become an instructor." So Very I cool. also just recently became um, a partner with them. So nice. I have a lot going on with USCCA, but I haven't talked about it much just because I'm on a once I become an official instructor, then mm -hmm. I have. Then you have access. Well, yeah, but, but then it makes more sense for me because I don't want right. to. I don't want to look like a fraud or anything. So I'm right. waiting until waiting until I build that up a little bit. Um, but I will be an instructor. I. It's not. I'll be honest. I don't think it's gonna be something where I'm going to be hardcore like running firearm training nonstop. But right. I am going to be offering opportunities. Awesome classes, sure. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Oh my God, that's great. Yep. I would. Uh, so. This is what I get confused about with Connecticut. Um, Connecticut says in order to take a class, you have to have uh, take a class that has live fire as part of the curriculum, and that's all it says. Other than uh, nothing other than the NRA home firearm safety doesn't count. The NRA basic pistol does. Pistol basic pistol shooting does. Okay. Um, that's it. That's all it says. And I get really confused. I'm like, well, does this class count? Would a USCCA shooting class count? Um, I think there, it's an actual permit class. It's an eight-hour permit course. Yeah. Um, it gets really confusing sometimes. Yeah, it kind of gets sucks. And I'm not... <laughs> Daryl? It's a um, communist state. But right. <laughs> Occupied territory is what I call us. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so in Massachusetts, we have specific classes that if you teach these classes, they have to be done by a, uh, a Massachusetts certified instructor. You don't need the NRA certificate to get your mass license, but you do have to have a certificate that says you've done the NRA class. And it had the certificate has to it's the state's certificate from the state police, and it has to be signed by someone that's an official certified instructor through the state. It's wicked it's confusing, kid. It's a lot. Hey, kid, it's really confusing. See, I'm lost. I've been looking into getting my Massachusetts permit because obviously I'm from Massachusetts and I'm up there family, yeah. at least once every other week. I'm gonna say, um, and you know, I I would like to be able to carry my gun over the border into Massachusetts. And yeah. Otherwise, there's days where I just can't wear it. So. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Uh, I do not have a Connecticut permit, so I, I am disarmed, but I'm not unarmed. If you know what I mean. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> oh, come on! Because of your uh, the pocket knife thing. I may have a couple of knives on me, and okay. I, I, I may you, have I may have the leg of a bar stool. All right, I got you. Uh, in the car. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And I also have aerosol hairspray and a big lighter. That's a flamethrower. Okay. So I am not unarmed. I'm disarmed, but I'm not unarmed. Gotcha. Anyway. Um, yeah.
yeah, I need. I want to get my Connecticut permit, and I want to get my Rhode Island permit too. Uh, and these are these are on my list of things that I need to do, but I but I haven't done it. So I feel like it's mandatory. Like with all of our states being so close together, like we're constantly it's, having to oh cross my gosh, through so them to travel. Like when I go once, to the Cape, once a week I I go to one of the places where I work and I drive in Connecticut for maybe a half mile and. Um, I drive through that area as fast as I can you because panic. I don't. Right? Well, that's the, that's the opposite of what you should be doing. You're not supposed to drive fast because then you get pulled over. <laughs> like. I used to say the same thing to people when I played in a band. We're like, listen, if you're drunk, drive home fast because there's, you know, get that's off the road. Horrible, horrible advice. I know. That's the best part about it. All right, listen, we need to wrap things up. We are almost yeah. back to where we need to be. Um, how can people find you and your biz and. Uh, I'll include DC project links. I'll include all that stuff. Honestly, the the best way to find me, I mostly use my my Instagram as my platform now. Yep. Um, it's kind of became instead of just family, it's a family post. It's now DC project posts and firearm stuff. So my Instagram, it's lomag underscore mary. So L O M A G underscore mary. What is Lomag? So low. <laughs> everyone always asks. Honestly, so, um, I see. I'm like, I don't know what this Lomag stuff is. No, Mark. So, and I probably should explain that one day. So uh, maybe I'll put a post out about that too. But <laughs> Martin, um, he calls me Louise, which is my middle name, so Mary Louise. So he calls me Louise, and my family's surname is McGuire. So the L-O from Louise and then the M-A-G from McGuire. Gotcha. And originally, I mean, that was just my marketing company's name. Um, and then now I use it for everything. So not that it's like, it's not firearm related by any means. And right. Diana Muller was also confused about that a bit. She's like, <laughs> what does this mean? It makes no sense. I'm like, it has nothing to do with guns. Right. So I thought, um, I thought it was, a, you know, you live in Connecticut, you got the magazine restriction. Oh yeah. That's kind of what I, but I could probably play off that. Thank you. I'm gonna steal that. <laughs> um, and then for the DC project, so you can go to dcproject.info, mm -hmm. and on there, I would say the the obviously you want to look under about. I think it is what it is, and that will show you um, your different state directors, mm -hmm. so you can learn about the other women within the DC projects. If you click on join, then it gives you the opportunity to join us, whether it be um, if you just want to offer donations, if you want to get more involved verbally, um, whatever it is, there's different opportunities for people within the DC project. Right. So you don't have to have your face. You can, you can help financially. You can stuff Absolutely. envelopes. You can send emails. If you're, if you have uh, some web talent, yep. uh, there's plenty of things for people to do. There is absolutely. There are plenty of things for people to do. All right, Mary, this has been a pleasure. I um, I feel bad because everyone's got to hear your story, except for me. Yeah. I mean, I heard your story through through other all of the other right. shows that you've been on. I and and uh, I think I got more of the story yeah. than other people did. So take that. <laughs> It's a lot more casual just driving around it, than it to is. look at myself in a, in a screen it's and on the right. camera. It is. It so. is. It is. Um, listen, before you head out, I want to give you a, uh, a couple of riding shotgun with Charlie Gun and Gungram stickers. What? Bam. Awesome. You got a riding shotgun patch. Love it. And uh, I, as I was digging through my stuff today, you got a riding shotgun with Charlie credit card knife. Not TSA. Not TSA. Approved. <laughs> Right? That's I, pretty cool. I Where, what have, camera can I hold this up into? Uh, any of them, fine. They're all working. Ooh. There we go. Get yourself a running shotgun with Charlie credit card knife. That's um, awesome. Yeah, they slip right into the wallet, um, so do not get caught with it in places. No. Nope. I had a friend of mine. I um, when I first got these, I was giving them out like candy, like I really was. So I gave them to a friend, and she got lost it on an airplane. Oh gosh. Like, yeah, she lost it at the TSA, and I'm like, I give her another one. Another guy's like, Hey man, I lost one at the. Uh, I went to the RNC. <laughs> oh gosh. And I lost one there. I'm like, All right, I'll get you another one, man. You're gonna have to show me afterwards so, how this thing functions. Absolutely. Right. Thank you so much for being absolutely. on the show. This thank is a you. pleasure. Thank you. Um, thank you for watching the show. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, if you are not a member of the Second Amendment Foundation, you can join them at saf.org. You can also uh, donate to the, you can donate to the DC Project, but you can donate to the CCRBKA, the Citizens Committee for the uh, Right to Keep and Bear Arms. Um, 
Thank you for watching the show, man. If you want to get some running shotgun stuff, go to runningshotgunwithcharlie.com. You can get a teal t-shirt. These are brandy new. Um, I'm definitely getting one of those. Awesome. I bought one for myself because they were on sale. Yep. Like, I'm not necessarily thrilled that I can't buy myself a sample, yeah. but uh, I wish they would hook a brother up. Yeah, but, but they cool. don't, but, uh, but I dig them. Like anyway, uh, thank you guys for watching the show. Um, check out this, uh, all of your Pro Freedom podcasts in one place at sdrn.us. That's the Self Defense Radio Network. And uh, we will see you guys next time. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Awesome.